Welcome everyone, good afternoon. Welcome to Improving Indicator 6 Data Quality to Reflect Inclusive Practices. We are delighted to have you join us today and we appreciate you taking the time to spend with us. We know that you all have competing priorities and we're glad that you decided to spend the next 50 minutes with us. A couple of reminders before we get started today. We will be concluding a little early so that you can get to the OSEP monthly TA meeting. And we will also be recording this webinar. The slides and recording from this presentation will be on the IDC website. In just a second, I'm going to show you how to get there after the presentation. You all will be muted. Please type any and all questions in the chat box. And uh, right before the end of the webinar at 2.45, we'll be having an online evaluation. So stay tuned for that. We really do look at those evaluations and your input is very much appreciated. So in terms of where you will find the webinar slides and recording, you're going to, you can just go into our search engine on the IDC website, do a search, for Indicator 6 webinar, and then on the right-hand side, you will see, um, or you can go to the uh, View Past Events um, the View Past Event recordings, and you can find it there. So either way, we'll get you there, and you will click on the link, um, and you'll find this where to, um, and this is the landing page for where the webinar will be. You'll find a YouTube recording on the right-hand side, and then you'll see today's presenters on the right-hand side under that YouTube recording link. And speaking of presenters, I am Vera Straub Rontier. I am a TA specialist for the IDEA Data Center, and I am so happy to be joined today by Ryan Gutzman, who is the 619 coordinator at the Washington Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction. And also, we are joined by Jennifer Story, who's the Program Improvement Supervisor at the Washington Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction. So our agenda today is that we're going to first take a look at that education environment's definition, really as a way to just level set and make sure we're all on the same page. Then we'll take a look at Washington's preschool data, and then some of the initiatives initiatives they have in order to move that data forward. Lastly, we'll take a look at some of the, we'll sort of peek behind the curtain and talk to, uh, Jennifer will walk us through some district discussions they had around their least restrictive environment data plat platform. And then as we have time for questions, we hope to be able to answer them as well. So really today, Today's effort is around looking at the importance of improving indicator six data quality and really accurately reporting those educational environments, as well as understanding how Washington really looked closely at data and professional development and what they did in, in that way to really move the needle on their, their data and continue to make improvements each year. Many of you are aware of the definitions of educational environments at the preschool level. However, we are going to take a few minutes to review what they are to help you better understand the data that Ryan will share in a few minutes. One of the things that Washington learned from taking a deeper dive of their Indicator 6 data was that there are two distinct things that they needed to sort of mediate at that district level, and that was the student information system and the IEP vendor that the district used. So the state code that you see there became really important so that they, so districts understand what was meant for each of those um, reporting categories. So, and in this, in this table that you can see, we are using both the 618 file code as well as the legacy code or the decision tree reporting code uh, in order to define that. But in Washington, that was known as state code 14. And that, uh, again, evidenced by these are the things that populate into 6A, 
we know that A1 and B1 equal that reporting for 6A, and then you can see on the slide those things that define A1, and that A2 is, well, it's included in the calculation, it is included in the denominator. So if we are not providing those services in regular education classrooms, then that's reflected as something that doesn't help us move it, this data in a positive way. So if we go into the next slide, these are the same definitions, essentially, but these are for kids who are in, or children, who are in programs less than 10 hours a week. So again, that category of A1 plus B1 equals what we see in 6A for indicator 6. And, uh, and uh, uh, so understanding the distinctions between those is important as we look at those, the data. So if we go, go on to the other categories, we see that uh, C1, C2, and C3 are those more restrictive settings or special, separate special education classrooms. And Washington had a lot of those separate special education classrooms, and they're really working towards moving those classrooms into uh, thinking about ways to either move that, change those classrooms to more inclusive classrooms, or getting out in those community-based settings across the state. So, um, and then, then if we move on to those D1 categories, we can see that home setting and then service provider location in terms of thinking about um, what makes up indicator 6C, which is new for this year, as many of you know. And th this calculation for 6C only contains D1. It does not include service provider location. And many of you know that since you've been spending your time the last few months uh, setting your targets for the next SPP ATR. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Ryan. Thank you, Vera, and thank you for having us today. It's, uh, it's uh, I would say, exciting uh, to be able to share our journey with you. Um, looking at the data, um, <laughs> it's not as exciting, <laughs> but that's, that's um, okay. You know, a lot of honest conversations have led us to um, some incredible opportunity and, um, I think, growth within our system, so we're thrilled to be able to share all that we've done. Um, what you see in front of you is our uh, three-year trend looking from 2017 to 2019. Um, what we know about the data um, up until that point was that it was connected with kindergarten. And so in Washington, what we found is when we actually integrated the data of our preschool and our kindergarten uh, children, it didn't look as bad. Um, and when we started to pull out our preschool data, which we now do and have done um, intentionally um, in 2019, 2018, 19, and then in 2020, when we had that reported separately, we, we noticed that when we pulled out our kindergarten data from our preschool data, that the numbers actually went the wrong direction. So they were going higher, we wanted them to go lower, and lower, we wanted them to go higher. Um, but within 6A, where our, the majority of our children are receiving services in program with their typical peers, we're at a fairly low point um, compared to our national partners. We're looking at around 23%. Actually, for 2020, we dropped from um, in 2019 when we were at Roughly 26%, we dropped in 2020 to 21% for children accessing a regular early childhood program when we were looking specifically at our preschool population. These are the numbers that we have been elevating over the last couple of years, and this is where we will start to see um, when we share some of the strategies that we have uh, developed to support not only state level, but regional and local level data conversations. We've developed a data uh, LRE data uh, platform that Jen's going to walk us through, but a lot of different opportunities have developed because we've embraced this. This is where we are, this is what we are working with, and it's an opportunity for us to step in and to uh, do that analysis of data to inform not only practices in classroom, but systemic practices and really stepping into that space of equity and where are we 
in need of dismantling systemic racism and institutional racism to support where we move forward. So I'll stop there. Yep, so we're gonna transition over to our initiatives. So that was our, our why. Our data is our why, it's our purpose, it's our passion, and it brings us to what we're going to do. And so I, uh, you know, reflect on the, the golden circle of Simon Sinek and, and where we go into the how and the what. And so this is where the initiatives come into play. Um, we have really embraced uh, the, the intersectionality or, and the connection between social emotional learning and whole child development and how that connects to later success in life. How do we support foundations for children in or their earliest years across settings to ensure that they have equitable access but also consistent uh, access to evidence-based practices that work for them. Um, so with that, social emotional learning embedded with inclusionary practices in our early childhood program is our focus. Uh, we are utilizing our 619 funds to step into the space of inclusionary practices and social emotional learning. We're grounding all of this work in the frameworks of MTSS structure and we're tying this into a P12 system of support that we're rolling out throughout our state. We can go to the next slide. This is a very friendly look at a lot of work that's happening in our state. Uh, in 2019, we received the Intensive Technical Assistance Grant from NCPMI that supported the initial implementation of Pyramid Model in Washington. At the same time, we uh, developed an initiative called the Research to Action Preschool Inclusion Champions Project. And that um, brought in a lot of different opportunities, not only at the national level, but also at the regional and local level for us to identify partners that were interested in inclusionary practices and also to uh, move forward in a way that we could bring in implementation science strategies and ensure that everything that we were bringing forward to that state, regional, and local level was done so with intention, connected to evidence-based practices, connected to the fidelity of implementation, um, and truly connected to co-creation and cohesion of systems from top to bottom and back again. So again, just bringing in those foundational supports of implementation science and exploration, implementation, et cetera, have gotten us to a point where we've developed a very robust uh, system of support within our state that we hope as we move past uh, the impacts of COVID as it's affecting our LRE uh, to see a lot of growth and um, in the long-term equitable access for children with disabilities, not only in our preschool settings, but also we hope to see this within our early childhood uh, child care centers, within our uh, state and federal preschool programs. Washington State is a mixed delivery system um, when it comes to early learning programming. We have obligations to support and serve children with disabilities in preschool um, with school-based as well as we have state-funded preschool programs and federally-funded preschool programs that are supported in a separate agency from OSPI. Uh, so as you can imagine, it becomes a little more um, bumpy at times for our schools to navigate how best to support kids. Um, you'll see at the bottom, the Preschool Inclusion Collaboration Team is a, our foundational support. This is our grassroots uh, initiative that we pulled together around 2018 uh, to bring it, anybody interested in early childhood education. How does this work for you? Um, what are your interests? How might you help? So we bring in families, legislators, uh, higher education, as well as our practitioners in the field of early intervention and preschool uh, administrators and beyond. And then again, we start to build those systems so we have voice and space for advocacy, but also uh, as many opportunities as possible to bring in the voice of community, um, intentionally bringing in um, our identified partners that might be identified as our district or more uh, marginalized community members as well. We are putting heavy emphasis and interest in developing relationships with our tribal communities and how we can support uh, implementation of special education practices as well as um, 
effective frameworks to support historical trauma as well as uh, identified trauma and poor practices strategies. So as you can see, we have a continuum that we are developing. Um, we're incredibly proud of the work, and we have a number of resources that we'd love to share with you um, today, but also at a different time. So I'll um, move forward to the next slide, and we just want to show you some of the cool things that we've developed. This is a teaser uh, for where we're going to go next, and we are going to uh, take this over to the um, interactive map. So we have, there we go, um, we have developed a early childhood special education interactive map to support all the different initiatives that we have in Washington. Um, and it's a really nice way for those that are curious about what what is this initiative Randa spoke of, or you know what, I'm really wondering, I need to partner. So it, you know, holds many services. So we go to uh, legislative districts, it, we added that in intentionally so that we could make sure that we are offering, one, I'm a school district, I'm a parent, um, I'm, you know, an advocate that wants to know where, what is my legislative district? How would I possibly know? How do I advocate? How do I support? So we've broken this down. What you'll see also is that in different shadings, uh, we have ESC 114, 189 are popping out to me, ESC 105. So across the state of Washington, we have nine ESDs, educational service districts, that are the, the liaison, that loop between, or that funnel between our state and our locals. And we rely on them heavily to support and to maintain consistency um, with all of the work that we do at the state. So not only can we see where are they at within their ESDs, but also where are they within their legislative districts so that we can advocate, or I think at this time of year, we're getting ready for ledge sessions. So we can share this with our legislators and say, these are the initiatives that we've developed. Here's our in interactive map so that you can see within your legislative districts which schools and partners you might want to reach out, if, out to if you're interested in inclusion in early childhood education, so twofold. And then also the school district link is incredibly helpful as Washington, obviously, as with data, we are um, at a place of growth a place of change, a place of open collaboration where we want to have um, some partnerships. And when you sit in the space of early childhood special education, it's a silo. It is one of the deeper valleys that we can have in education at times because it is um, one that is it's unique in what we do and how we support our families and also the different av avenues of collaboration with community-based uh, partners that we have. So. We want to offer this to our school district partners to say, okay, again, regionally, who's doing this work that might be able to collaborate with me? So depending on where you're at, you can select if there are schools in Washington. Um, and we know that, you know what, hmm, uh, uh, Auburn, for example, is one of our, our partners. We can click on Auburn and we can go there and then they're gonna tell us what project they're in and then who the contact or the school is so that we can start making some connections there. Yep, so that's our PIC. PIC is a Preschool Inclusion Champions Network. This is our network that is going to focus on base implementation of inclusionary practices. When we're a PIC site, we've developed a program-wide team. We've identified coaching um, leads in our school, and we've taken the time to walk through the preschool um, program self-assessment, we've identified vision mission for our agency, we've identified action plans and priorities, and we're getting ready to develop and go to that next stage of implementation around installation and, and implementation. So we're really excited that Auburn's actually one of our schools that's been in project for two years. A lot of schools like Auburn are going from self-contained to, you know what, we want to go full inclusion. And that's what we've seen over the last two years with these sites is that we have one of our sites is 23 classrooms and they went from maybe a quarter of those being inclusive to full inclusion within two years of implementation of this project work. So it's incredibly exciting. I think that's a good, a good overview. We'll drop all the links and share this if you're curious about how we develop this. Um, but super excited to be able to share this and um, find some usable tools that have, have helped move this conversation forward for us. 
Awesome. This is just a reminder um, for us as we share, but also important about that connection to multi-tiered systems of support. Washington received the SIDIG grant, Special Education Professional uh, Development grant, um, last year. And so we are putting our heavy emphasis on this work in multi-tiered systems of support. And as we do this, we are making Washington Pyramid Model a part of this implementation. So as the schools are identified, we're taking all the work that we've been doing uh, in developing multi-tiered systems of support in early childhood and lining this with what's happening in K-12. So we recognize the need that to, we, you know, we're stronger when we're connected and when we're collaborating. So we are in collaboration with our agency partners as well as our external partners to align these practices to make sure that we're um, on each other's side. We have also uh, started a training track at all of our regional sites. So every regional lead uh, pro program has a implementation specialist who is going to be a master trainer and coach of Washington Pyramid Model. And when needed, they'll be tagged in from the secondary cohort of multi-tiered systems with support leads to train out. So we're being very intentional about how we're supporting our regional leads, offering master training, master coaching supports, and then aligning with our other initiatives to make sure that we're all on the same page, speaking the same language, and advocating for the same change of system. Um, and so this is a newer development. This will be um, something we're lifting this year, but very excited about the outcomes that we'll see. Next slide. And these are some examples for you of um, some of the, let's say more so, some of the visuals and ways that we're sharing this out. So what you see here, we have a link to our Washington Pyramid Model Implementation Specialist Dashboard. So we'll make, again, make sure that you have the links. Um, the dashboard is a tool that we're using through Smartsheets. Our um, special education, early childhood special education uh, inclusion specialist, Julie Dean, is amazing and has done a phenomenal job of developing communication systems to ensure that regardless of your partnership, there's a place for you to go to access information. So uh, definitely something to review and be inspired by. Um, and again, we've developed this through Smartsheets, so that's been a very handy tool for us. The three layers of coaching is uh, something that Washington has done to take Washington, to take Pyramid and to make it Washington Pyramid. We have um, layered in that implementation specialist, which at one time may have been thought of as an external coach, but we are meeting the needs of our local communities, recognizing that we have um, rural remote community partners that may not have capacity to have a coach in their school and that's where they're gonna need that regional coach to come in and to support and to facilitate. Um, so that's just um, a little bit as to why that looks different from a model if you're familiar with Pyramid as a whole. Program coaches, practitioner coach, or internal within the school base, implementation specialist for us is an external coach that we're developing and refining so that they can meet the needs of our region. And again, having continuity in training and continuity in, in the coaching uh, processes has been very important for us to maintain messaging. And then the frameworks of implementation is just available for you to reflect on, um, where we're really stepping into the use of evidence-based practices, the review of data and using data to guide instruction, and using data, again, to leverage where we have need to change the stem and to address inequities that are being seen um, at, you know, at the cost of child and family experience, truly. Really. Next slide. All right, and I think we're going to tag in Jennifer's story to share about some of the incredible data uh, tools that we've developed with, with our team. Okay, I think I'm going to be past the control so that I can share my screen. There we go. All right, so I am going to share a couple of ways that we are engaging our partners in um, looking at data. I'm actually going to start with looking at my very busy desktop. I'm going to start with um, an outward facing document. This is something we have posted on our website um, because our state 
beyond just the preschool, just the preschool efforts that Ryan was talking about, we also have um, an inclusionary practices project statewide that is for all grade levels. And it was a, a $25 million project um, that the state legislature allocated um, for, for two years and it's been extended into, um, because COVID hit right in the middle of that, um, has been extended beyond the two years. But we have uh, focused on um, identifying district partners and working on improving inclusionary practices. And so as a result of that, we have a lot of data to share. And this is an, a document that's available on the website so that anybody can look at it. And it has a tab for K-12, and then it also has a tab for preschool LRE. And it shows by district level the percentages of students across those different codes that Bureau showed um, at the beginning of the session. And it shows three years worth of data. So it starts with um, 2018, 2019, and then the official change in 2020 was when we removed uh, five-year-olds who were in kindergarten and moved them into the other um, indicator five data collection. So this is an easy way for districts to just look at a snapshot and for anybody to look at a snapshot of districts and what their change has been over the last three years. What a lot of districts have made a lot of improvement based on this priority on the IPP we've had for the last several years. But it also helps look at the effect of removing the kinder, the five-year-old tour in kindergarten and what effect that had. So if you look at individual districts um, with having those five-year-olds in kindergarten are officially increasing that percentage. And then other districts like Auburn, who um, Ryan pointed out is one of the groups that she's working with with the um, pyramid model and all those efforts um, has gone up. Um, even removing the kindergartners from that calculation, they've increased from um, 63% up to 84%. So it's just a really good way to look at um, looking at the district's change over time. The other thing that I wanted to share was our data platform. So we've been doing this for about three years now, three or four years. And it's a data platform that we have shared. So as Ryan mentioned, we have nine different ESDs, regional ESDs, that all serve a number of districts across the state. Our department, our special ed department at the state education agency, um, we each, each of the regions has a liaison. So Ryan and I are each liaisons to two of those regions. And then other program supervisors are liaisons for the other regions. We, each of the regions meet with their special education directors for every school district in that region, typically once a month. Um, some of the regions are not once a month, but most of them are monthly. And so the, as liaisons, we participate in those meetings and we do data dives with the directors when we're out there. We've also done this particular data dive with superintendent groups across the state and principal groups. So we're trying to get the information out there to as many folks as we can. The challenge with this particular data platform is that it has end sizes that are smaller than 10. And so we are not able to publicly post it onto the website. Right now, it's currently living in our district federal fund application. So when they, when they complete their grant every year, um, the people who have access to the grant, which is typically the special education administrative team, they have access to the platform. And then we also um, do data dives with them. I, I actually did one yesterday with one of the regions to train them on what all is in here, how do you use it, how do you look at it, and, and give them some time to actually investigate their district data. So it's set up, um, it looks pretty complicated, but it's set up with an overall school profile tab. So they can type in, every, every school building has a four-digit code, and they can just type in um, any code, and, and there's a, a sheet that shows the codes for all the schools. And this first page will give them just an overview of the demographics of that school. And it'll tell them if they're in a support status under, under ESSA, um, what that might be, and then their demographic data. At the bottom, you'll see all the different tabs of data. Blue, the blue ones are all looking at disability category. So they look at disability category overall. Um, English learner status, and then by race and ethnicity. The green tabs are looking at least restrictive environment data, also by um, disability category, by race, ethnicity, by grade level. 
the dark blue and the dark green are school age, so they're K-12. The light blue and the light green are early childhood, so they're the preschool data. So that's kind of how this is set up. I'm just going to show a couple of tabs just to, to show you kind of how it's set up and how it works. So a district can go in to um, any tab and they can type in, so if, it, if it's set to all, all in all, and I've hidden this one because I don't, it's got, again, it's got N sizes smaller than 10, so I didn't want to display actual district data. But if you leave it at all, all in all, it'll show you the state level data. You can change just the ESD data if you want to look at one of the nine regions as a whole, because our regions vary quite a bit from region to region as to their inclusionary practices with um, preschool students. You can also leave that as all and look at the district level. So if you just change the district to pick your district name, it'll show you your total district data. Or you can leave those two as all and just pick a school. And if you pick one school, it's just going to show you the data for that school. So this particular data tab is showing the breakdown of preschool students by disability category. And it show, it, all of these tabs show the data in a table, and then they show it in a chart. So they show it both ways, depending on what kind of visual uh, person you are, what your preferences are, showing them both ways. Another one I wanted to point out is the Early Childhood LRE um, by Race Ethnicity. That's one that we are really focusing on. Um, this, this last few years, this was a new data collection tab that was added to our, our data dive. Um, this is showing just an example preschool program. It just enables the, the team to look at how those placements differ um, by race ethnicity. So you can see, for example, in this particular program, children who are black or African American are much less likely to be served in a regular early childhood program and receiving their SDI in that program as compared to the other race ethnicity groups. So it's, it's just, so again, other ways of looking at the data to really help teams expand beyond um, what, the, what they think might be happening within their programs. The other tab we added this year is a risk ratio. So we calculate, as all states do, we look at disproportionality um, and significant disproportionality, and we use risk ratios to do that. We've often been asked by districts to, um, we have to report on the data at the district level. Districts have often asked us, how do I look at this at a school level? Because if they want to target certain schools for certain activities, they need a way of knowing where is their disproportionality the most evident. And so this is, this is a new thing that we added this year that they can just enter their, any code, any building that they want to look up. It will plug in the numbers of students and it will identify the risk ratio. Um, so for example, in this particular school, students who are Pacific Islander are three times more likely to be identified for special education. So it gives them an idea of, of the disproportionality that's incurring at the school level so that they can start working on school level activities to address it. So this is, a, again, this is a data platform that we keep from year to year, we maintain an update and we add based on um, input we get when we do the data dives with our districts. We, we get information from them on what other data do they want to see and then each year the platform kind of evolves to not only look at the priorities we're, we're focusing on but also to address um, requests from districts as to what additional data would be helpful for them to look at. And Mary, we did see your question that, that about the A2 category, so we, that's why we dropped the link in the chat uh, with the, um, the coding manual, the CEDARS manual, so you can see exactly what they are in Washington. I'm not seeing any other questions, Jen. Okay. Well, then I think it, is it back to you now, Vera? I think it is, yes. Okay. So keep, continue to keep those questions coming. Um, we have a little bit of time. We have about uh, nine minutes till we need to move on to the evaluation. So we gave you lots of information 
in a short time, but certainly please, please uh, reach out to Ryan and Jen, of course myself, but I think you can see that they really worked so hard in that and, uh, on this and um, just so much work has gone into the effort and the data is really changing. So in that, and um, as Ryan said, as we are getting ready to uh, prepare for this presentation, Washington has had chronically low uh, data, data in indicator six, and they really, really are changing that trajectory in a real way. So, and I think you also said maybe the lowest 10 in the country, Ryan? We are, we are uh, 50, 54 out of 59, I think, when we target some territories, yeah. Yeah, we can, I mean, I don't want to say we can't go down, but we are uh, absolutely bent and determined to take this up. So it's, it's going to be a great opportunity for us with the, the target setting. We start actually that conversation in the next two weeks. So um, like this, this is a really special opportunity for us to take it to our state um, and to our state design team as we go through target setting to make this um, a continued us lift and recognizing that to make this shift that we have to do it through partnership and, and collaboration. So um, we're gonna make the best out of this. Well, if you don't have any other questions, we're, we're not gonna keep you. I did want to uh, thank Ryan and Jennifer again so much for their presentation today. We really appreciate it. And we certainly, uh, I mean, I so, appreciate all the work that you've done uh, in this area. I mean, it really means a lot to children and families and, and it's so appreciated. Um, I also want to thank Sophia and Jenny from IDC who really helped us navigate and uh, do the things that we need to do so that we can be better presenters so that you can hear the information in a real and meaningful way. Also, I want to give a shout out to Washington's IDC state liaison, Heather Reynolds, um, who really encouraged me to um, talk to Ryan and Jennifer and uh, it, uh, and get more information about what they're doing uh, relative to their data for Indicator 6. 